Welcome everyone to Davin with a Friend. It's our third week of our course of deepen, how to deepen your relationship with Hashem, with God. And our audience is super diverse and I love that so much. If you are joining us live, thank you, you have made my day. If you're joining us on Torah anytime we're YouTube, here's what you should do. Go to Davin for a Friend, D-A-V-E-N, D-A-V-E-N, Davin for a Friend, and just put your name in the email. Here's what you're going to get, a weekly invitation to this class, this incredible virtual circle. We're about to head into some prayer, and you too will be um, working towards deepening your relationship with Hashem. There's such an energy when it's live, so that's my invitation. Now, on this very special day, I want to open up the stage to Hannah Crystal. Um, okay, hello everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, so excited to be here once again. Um, and this week's tefillah is going to be based on the teaching Rivka Maka gave last week. So I'm really excited for those of you who are here last week and for those of you who weren't, don't worry, just follow along. Um, Rivka Maka suggested a three step to feel a, almost like formula, which is Hashem, I know you love me. I'm totally open to the possibility that you are already taking care of this. And thank you for taking care of this. And I have used this in my life last week over and over and over. I probably used it in the hundreds of times. Um, and it's brought me great, great comfort and um, really Yeshua in my life real salvation. So I'm really excited to open this to feel it together with everyone here. So just taking a breath. And I thank Hashem so much for bringing our collective souls together in this beautiful moment in time. And I ask Hashem, it is my intention that, um, this tefillah, our individual tefillahs and our group tefillah together bring tremendous salvation to ourselves, to our families, to all the world, and bring down great, great rachamim, great mercy, and that we go from this plague into geula, into redemption, with speed, with speedily and with, with tremendous mercy. Amen. <sighs> So I invite you to close your eyes. And in this week's tefillah, we're going to start with a tefillah for yourself. We'll expand it to a tefillah for, for somebody in your life. And then we'll expand it to, the tefillah, to a tefillah for the world. So find inside of yourself a tefillah that you are davening for. And I invite you to draw your attention to your breath. As I draw my attention to my breath, I am reminded of Hashem's constant, consistent love for me. Even when I'm not putting my attention on my breath, Hashem lovingly breathes life into me. And I muted you for a moment because I had to mute everyone. I'm sorry. Go ahead. With this reminder and, and attention on your breath and awareness that Hashem is breathing life into you at this very moment with his love, I invite you to stay with me and holding your tefillah in mind. Hashem, I know you love me. Hashem, you've taken care of me in the past. Every single detail of my life was taken care of by you, and I have evidence for this. And you will continue to take care of me. I allow myself to embrace that trust and knowing that you are taking care of this. So I invite you to say with me right now, I am totally open to the possibility that you are taking care of this for me. Just allow yourself to believe those words. 
And now visualize in your mind what it will feel like to have this need taken care of and how truly grateful you will feel and allow yourself to just feel that deep appreciation and knowing that it is being taken care of by Hashem in the most loving and divine manner. And I invite you to say with me right now, thank you Hashem for taking care of this for me. Thank you in advance for taking care of this for me. Okay, now let's make the circle bigger and let's dive in for a friend. So choose someone from your life who you know that could, could be using your tefillos and just have a clear tefillah, clear intention in mind for what you're diving for. And let's say these, these powerful words together again. And I invite you to, to close your eyes and really internalize these words. Hashem, I know you love the child I am praying for. I'm totally, say it with me, I'm totally open to the possibility that you are taking care of your child. Mm. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you in advance for taking care of this child of yours. The energy is so beautiful. Let's expand it to the world. Let's expand this energy, this tefillah to the world. Say it with me. Hashem, I know you love your children. I know you love your children. Every creation. I am totally open to the possibility that you are taking care of your children. Every single child on this planet. Say it with me, Hashem. I am totally open to the possibility that you are taking care of your children. And now, thank you, Hashem, in advance for taking care of your children. Thank you for taking care of your children in the most divine and loving manner. And let's close this to feel with the breath, which reminds us of Hashem's constant and consistent love for us and for every breathing and living thing on this planet. Thank you. Hannah, that was so amazing. Thank you, dear. Whoa, what a pleasure. Wow, that was a beautiful tefillah. Okay, guys, that was a great opening, and we are going to take it from there. We're going to open up with a question. It's an interesting question, and it's right here in our chat box. And to the, to the person who wrote me this long, beautiful letter in the chat box, thank you. I will be reading it. I see it. Um, her question is, what is the difference between God and an imaginary friend? It's like my security blanket could also make me feel warm and cozy. I can dream up a friend. I can dream up a savior. What makes this any different? Maybe human nature, as they say, religion is the opiate of the masses. Maybe it's just a bunch of, you know, it's not, not true. Now, while this may not be a question that everyone has because we're a very God-centered bunch, it is a very important question to just get to the bottom, like to just put out there, okay? Nothing is worth anything when it's not true. That's the difference between God and an imaginary friend. So in the very famous class, which you're welcome to look up, an excellent class called the Truth Happiness Conundrum. Rabbi ben, pardon me, Rabbi ben Sion Klatsko, my brother, he asks this question, would you rather know the truth or would you rather be happy? Which one? And a lot of people are like, I'd rather be happy. Ignorance is bliss. But then he starts asking them some more questions. He says, okay, so let's say you're happily married. This is his example. It's going to sound crude, and I'm so sorry for that. Not because he's crude, just 
It's like so awful. He said, let's say you're super happily married. Your spouse is lovely and things are going well. And someone says, I saw your spouse with another woman. I saw them laughing and talking. I saw them multiple occasions. What would you rather? Would you rather the happiness of just going on your merry way? Or would you rather know the truth? It's not enough to be happy. It's not enough to have a security blanket. It's not enough to have an imaginary friend. If something isn't the truth, it's useless. It's worse than useless. It's living a lie. And we can't be with that. Once upon a time, my son, my husband, pardon me, was in rabbi training. And the teacher posed a question to them. Um, in Judaism, are, we're always striving to keep the mitzvahs of the Torah, to, to be observant, to do God's will. And then there's some rabbis that really, you know, it's their mission to teach those who don't have the benefit of a Torah education all about the Torah. We call this outreach, kirov. So the rabbi said to the students who are going to be doing outreach, he said, okay, you meet a family. They're a lovely family. The husband and wife get along like two peas in a pod. The children are beautiful and well-behaved. They give charity. They have family dinner together. They have rituals. They're so happy. They're such good people. Now you're going to come to them and you're going to say, you know, follow the Torah. Why should they listen to you? Why? And this was the most fascinating class I ever heard because these young rabbinic students were completely fumbled. They're like, well, following the Torah makes your marriage better, but my marriage is already better. Their marriage is already good. Um, teaches you how to raise your kids, but there you have really good kids. Teaches you to do acts of kindness and charity, but they do that too. We're not, we're not really sure. They were stumped. And as I was listening to them, this was maybe 25 years ago, I was getting really stumped. I was like, wait, why? What, what would be the point here? <laughs> you know, what are you adding? The truth is what you're adding. If something's not rooted in the truth, then your whole entire construct is nothing. It's like the Truman Show. You guys ever see the Truman Show? The Truman Show, he's got this wonderful life, but it's not the truth. If it's not the truth, then it's all nothing. Now, how can we prove that God is the truth? Answer, we cannot. He gives us 99.9% .9 circumstantial evidence, 99.9% of wisdom, and he leaves us space for us to doubt. Why? So many reasons. First of all, if God was provable, then we would be above God, right? We know about gravity. Gravity doesn't know about us. That which you prove means I figured it all out. We do not figure out God. That's his kindness to us. It's like trying to figure out your parent. You're 16 years old and you're trying to figure out your parent. If you could actually figure out your parent when you're 16 years old, you're no longer safe. You're parentalized. It's a wonderful thing that your parent has calculations that you'll never know about. It's a wonderful thing that they hold in some of their feelings some of the time. You don't want to know it all. You want to be cared for. So this space of not knowing this is God's bigness. And it allows us to be the receivers and the children. Not only that, but if we really knew God, if we saw him, if we saw his light, we would be so blown away. We would not have free choice. There would be no life. We would <laughs> be like, okay, I'm doing this, you know. It's like, it's the same thing. Seeing God's light is like the same thing as having a gun against your head. You'll have no choice. I, this is the truth. I'm blinded. He wants to give us this experience of choosing. In choosing, we find closeness. Did you ever hear of a mail order bride? One of the saddest things, you know, you just see a woman in Vietnam or wherever, any country, and okay, I'm, I want her. Now you're married. It looks great on the outside. Where's the love? Where's the connection? It's, it's you know, what do you want? When you ask that mail order bride, will, will you marry me? It means zero, nothing. But when you build a relationship with someone and you say, I see you, I appreciate you, I want you, I want to commit to you, that is a really invested and enjoyable, passionate relationship. 
So in that space of not knowing and of constantly climbing towards this force that is always just out of our reach, we build this relationship. We're chronically and constantly saying, God, I want you. And what he does is there's a Kabbalistic graph that basically um, shows us that we like are always coming towards God and yet we never reach him. We're always going towards. He will always be greater than us. And that's so amazing because that means that we're always like have something to long for. There's always passion. There's always higher to reach. So um, I don't know exactly why God led me to express that here because proving God is, is really not my thing, but it was a question. So if that particular answer or response was meaningful to your heart or avoda your service in any way i would really love to know just put it in the chat box please so i can just hear because i'm curious why we went into that um so it all boils down to faith yeah well actually there's this beautiful idea that says that a malik who is our nemesis is the idea of the brain the calculations and that's why a malik can come and mess with your head. I can say Chava is the nicest person. She does such nice things all the time. And you say, oh, really? I think she's I think she's a little selfish. You know, I think Chava's got a real selfish streak. And all of a sudden my brain starts twisting. Oh, so is she being nice? Is it for me or is it for her? The brain is susceptible to being to distortions. Hashem doesn't want any distortions. He says, Love me, because the heart knows what it knows, as we spoke about in our class yesterday. You've got to know what you know. Now, this goes back to our last week's class. Why? Because in our last week's class, we were talking about like being willing to receive from Hashem, the bride who so doubts her groom, how can she overcome this? There's nothing to prove. Susan here says it... Um, Susan here says it boils down to faith. I want to say yes, it boils down to your willingness to have faith, your willingness to know what you know. Once you know what you know, then you will see proofs of miracles, as Susan also said here, everywhere in your life. You just open your eyes and you will see it. And not only that, but the more you look, the more you'll see this orchestration, pay attention because you might have a week like this, where daily, on an hourly basis, let's just call it on a daily basis, you can almost feel God picking you up and plucking you from one experience to the next. One experience to the next. Like literally opening up your life. And some of the experiences are very hard. They are. But you can start to get this awareness of something's happening to me. Someone's working on me. Someone wants something from me and is growing me and pushing me. You feel pushed. You feel tugged. You feel expanded. You're given an opportunity. You feel squashed. You know, we are not left alone in this universe. So we can numb out. Definitely. We can just like do our day and live in a lack of spiritual awareness. Or we can open up to that beautiful tefillah Hashem. I know you love me. I know you love me. You're doing this for me. We're going to spend our last few minutes discussing another topic. Okay. This happened to also come up in class last night. It's so interesting, but it came up for me personally. Once you know what you know, that God does love you, that he's really not out to get you. You start to look at, what do I expect out of life? Is my patterning that I expect for it to be hard? That I expect for there to be unbearable challenges? And you start noticing that you're interacting with God in that way. So we had a young lady, and I won't tell you her details, but we had the opportunity to coach her in coaching school. And what came out was this um, awareness that 
she had been through a great many years of challenge and she had stuck it out and she was strong and she soldiered on and she became so, so strong. And she felt like I can't anymore. I'm just going to break now. This is this right now. This is too much for me. It hit that point. She said, I don't feel comfortable to like complain about this or to ask God to change it because he's so good to me. Like I'm going to ask to change it. I feel ashamed. But the thing is, if you know that God is loving and you know that he's listening, then when you feel I can't, do you understand the tone of I can't? There's a point in everyone's life or different points where it's like, I can't. Then the prayer that I want to teach you today is, God, I can't do it anymore. I need a rescue. It's almost like we can get into a place of thinking that we need to soldier on, not realizing that that time is over. And it's okay. And you can relax now. You're allowed to say, it's too much for me, Hashem. I know you love me. And I'm talking to you to say, I'm done. And I just need gentle from here on. And then to be open to receiving the gentle. It's not to say that soldiering on is wrong. No, it creates a warrior. It creates an inner strength. It creates a person that does good even when they don't feel good. That shows up and shows up even when like, it's like the feeling of when am I going to get a break and the break never comes and you still go on doing good and serving God. But he doesn't want us to think that he's harsh. And when the moment rumbles up inside of you of, listen, I have to be real with you, Hashem. I can't anymore. My experience, and this is not from a, uh, a Torah source. We're talking about tefillah is avodah shebele, work of the heart. So my source is my heart, my experiences, and my experience in the birthing room, which I've only had a few privileges of attending besides for my own. But this, uh, I'll never forget this woman who was giving birth and the midwife heard her say, I can't. And she looked at me, this midwife, and she said, every time they say, I can't, that means the baby's about to come. Lo and behold, one or two more contractions, there comes the baby. So the tefillah of today is I can't. And it's not I can't of complaint. God, why are you so mean to me? Why don't you ever stop? Why don't you let up? No, it's I can't with the recognition that you love me. And this is real. And like in real life, in real time, I have really reached my limit. And my expression of emuna, of faith, is not to surrender and say, I'll take more. No, because at this point, more is just going to pull me away from you. My expression of emuna is to literally say, I just need you to rescue me. And I, I said to God recently, if I'll be honest, I cried to God recently. I was like, listen, I said, this is just between me and you. Like, if you're going to start doing an accounting of all the bad things I've done and all the bad ways I think, and all your angels who deliver all the messages are going to like get involved, then, you know, I'm never going to get anywhere. I need a private conversation just with me and you. I'm just telling you, I don't deserve it. I'm not, I don't deserve it. I'm just asking you because you love me and because I need it. I need it. I'm your child and I need it. In this private conversation, I just got to say, I can't. And could you come and change things and rescue me? You know, just me and you, God. Don't make any calculations. No calculations of what I do or don't deserve. I just need change. And the interesting part was that um, in that per particular experience, is that as I was praying out loud, I slowly started to space out. Like my words trickled away. They started to go away. When I, I used to pray in the garden, then I prayed in my office. Now my son sleeps here. So now I have to go take a drive in my car, park it somewhere. So I'm like talking really out loud and I'm really saying this. And um, I start to kind of zone out. And then I realize that peace has come to me. I feel peaceful. And this is what I want you to know, is that every, and I felt that I was answered. It was only a couple of hours ago, so I don't know what it'll look like, but 
I know that in my heart, there's peace. And I believe, I believe this so completely that no prayer is unanswered and that the deepest answer is the one that you get right there in prayer. That's the deepest answer. It's, you don't have to see it with your eyes. You pray until you feel better. You pray until you space out. You pray until it's peaceful in the heart. And let Hashem move the pieces in your life accordingly. Okay? So that's my encouragement for this week. If there's any of you out there that are in a life situation that you just thought, well, this is my life. And I want to be good. And I'm never going to complain. God gives me so much good. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I take responsibility to give you permission to say, Hashem, I know you love me. And I can't anymore. I, I just need a rescue. I can't. I gave it all I had, okay? That's my permission. That's my, um, my offering. And the second offering is don't pray light. A prayer of I can't is a prayer of a woman in transition. The baby's coming. You got to give it all you got. Pray until the peace comes. And then trust that things will change and they will move. And I bless you all, any of you that are in an I can't situation that you see miracles open up. Any of you who have questions about, is God real or am I talking to an imaginary friend? You ask him, point blank, I want to believe in you more. Please could you show me some signs? And I'll even be particular, even though you know me very well. You know, the signs that are really meaningful to me are, bump, 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 you know. Um, signs that are through nature, signs that are through people, signs that are through songs. I really want to hear. I want to hear. Please make me aware. Because struggling with faith is it's a very difficult struggle. And he can help you with that. I want to I want to believe in you. It's a beautiful prayer. Okay. Um, Marcella, we're going to be ending now. And Marcella, I need you to get off of the chat now. Okay. These are not these are not comments for this class. Thank you, dear. Alrighty. Um, thank you, everyone. And give yourself uh, some credit for a half an hour spent in, in a lot of thought. I feel there's a lot of thinkers out there today. Thank you, Susan. That is a beautiful class. Thank you, Rachel. And we are going to end with two psalms. So let's tune in, pay attention. Oh, thank you, guys. Go ahead, Rachel. I have one more thing to say. Um, I would like to say that it just occurred to me that we do have a source for the prayer of I can't. So it's very, very important. I'm, I'm learning in life to like rein in my heart feelings and like find them in the Torah so they can like be um, swallowed. So there is a source that says that at the end of Egypt, um, that at the end of Egypt, um, the Jews were just, they were in tatters. They just had nothing left. And it says, the Nitzak el Hashem, it says that in the Haggadah, they cried out to Hashem. And the commentators, commentaries over there say, they cried out, that was their prayer. A person doesn't even need to have words to have prayer. The Nitzak, the crying itself, is the prayer. That's the prayer. And it wasn't until they got to the point of Vanitzak that the redemption came. All the time that they were under the assumption of like, we're meant to be here. You know, this is our life. It's been 200 years, 210 years, it's just been a long time. All the time that they were settled there and they didn't get to the place of no more, I can't, then they didn't have a powerful enough prayer to create the velocity to push themselves out of the exile. Thank you, Hashem, for that source. Okay, everyone. Mwah. Have an awesome day. Bye. So, Shir la Malot, Esai Enai Ale Arim, Meain Yavo Ezri. Ezri Meim Adonai, Ose Shamaim Vaaretz. Al Yiten Lamot Raglecha, Al Yanum Shomrecha. 
הנה לא ינום ולא יישן, שומר ישראל. אדוני שומריך, אדוני צלך על יד ימינך. יומם השמש לא יככה וירח בלילה. אדוני ישמור מכ... ישמורך מכל רע, ישמור את נפשך. אדוני ישמור צאצך ובואך מעתה ועד עולם. A song for a sense. I shall rise, raise my eyes Rosal, to the... Rosal, I have a request. When yeah. you, could you change the THs to Ss? Like, could you read it in more modern English? The English part or the Hebrew part? The English part, when it says, like, thou doust. Like, oh, you know. absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so a song for a sense. I shall raise my eyes to the mountains. From where will my help come? My help is from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to falter. Your guardian will not slumber. Behold, the guardian of Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your guardian. The Lord is your shadow. He is by your right hand. By day, the sun will not smite you, nor will the moon at night. The Lord will guard you from all evil. He will guard your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from now and to eternity. Thank you.